Now I ask you to hear the word of the Lord as given to us in the fourth chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians. The fourth chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians, verses 1 through 10. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and parent of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But ye, each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is, in the, these last few minutes of the 20th century, an horrendous image which haunts my spirit and hounds my mind. It is a nightmare in broad daylight. It is the spectacle of young people, usually black, But as Jonesboro, Arkansas found out, not always. Usually male, but not always. Filing past television cameras. Manacled. Cuffed chained, dragging leg chains. And as we look into their faces, as they file past the television cameras, we can see that they are getting younger and younger and younger. Whereas just a few years ago, we were wringing our hands and shaking our heads at the prospect of babies having babies. We now struggle to stifle the screeching scream as it makes its way past our constricted vocal cords, as we ponder the terror of babies killing babies. 
And as I ponder this nightmare in broad daylight, An even more troubling question plagues my spirit. Who are they to you and your ministries of teaching and preaching and care? And who are you to them? And so I bring my question to you, Church of Jesus Christ. Who are they? Who are these captive youth to you? Your ministry. And who are you to them? I bring this troubling series of images and questions to this text, which I have read to you from the epistle to the Ephesians. A few years ago, my question and my struggle was both intensified and assisted by the request to preach for the women of Trinity Baptist Church, Baltimore. They had selected this Ephesians text as their theme scripture. And I tried my best to bring a message. But as I left Trinity Church, Ephesians 4 was still messing with me. And I could hear the text speak, Preacher, I'm not through with you yet. Truer words have not been spoken. For a time, it seemed that on almost every assignment, Bible study, teaching, preaching, lecture, I think even one of our, our convention addresses, this text kept following me, kept haunting me. I was forced to deal with Ephesians 4. And so I wondered what what's going on why is it that you are being arrested by this text why has ephesians uh, 4 taken up relentless persistent pursuit of my spirit why has it taken relentless domicile in my soul Perhaps my social location has something to do with the answer. I am an African-American teaching, preaching woman. And indeed, the historical work of African-American women has been survival of the race. Just check the record if you don't believe me. You will find throughout our history that wherever the race is in trouble, black women spring into action and will take on every demon in hell to protect our children and preserve the race. We inspire and encourage African-American men to take on the same struggle. And we partner in the struggle. So when I hear
clear that God in Christ has taken captivity captive and caused death to die? When I hear when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive and gave gifts to his people, I listen. But if God in Christ has done all of that, if Jesus Christ has fought the duel with death and won, why are there so many captives? Well, I struggled with this question until I realized that yes, Jesus Christ has taken captivity captive and caused death to die. But he has left to the church the work of chain removal. Now some are captive because nobody has told them. Jesus Christ loves even, uh, no, Jesus Christ loves especially you. Some are captive because nobody has told them. Jesus Christ has cut your shackles. Stand up and free yourself. But all of the captives are not outside the church. Some of us can't do the work of chain removal because we're too busy clinging to captivity in the church. We can't remove chains outside the church because we're stepping over too many captives in the church. Sometimes it's the captivity of sexism and racism and ageism and all of these isms which demean God's people. Colorism and heterosexism and all of the chains which exalt us or one group above another group. But Jesus Christ calls us to stand up for every one of those chains has already been broken. Captivity has already been captured. Stand up. Free yourselves. Stand up. Set the captives free. Remove the shackles. As I pondered this text, I wondered what this text really means. It says, in fact, the text asked the question. It says, when he says, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth. And the one who ascended is also the one who descended. I went to the scholars, to the commentaries, and I found some intriguing conversations about this ascending and descending. One commentator had a series of diagrams with arrows pointing this way and that way and, you know, to describe which ascension and what descension and when it occurred and to what it referred. And I thought, well now, that's all very interesting. But living where I live, and knowing what I know and seeing what I see, I, I didn't need any arrows. I, 
I didn't need any diagrams to tell me what this ascending and this descending was all about. Preacher, what, 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 what are you seeing? What, what does it mean to you? Well, it says to me, thanks be to God, that if Jesus Christ has taken captivity captive, that if he's also ascended, and that's the same one who descended, that means that now there is no unconquered space. That whether we go north or whether we go south, whether we go east or whether we go west, Captivity has been captured. There is no unconquered space. Indeed, wherever captivity rears its ugly head, it's a liar. It's a fraud. It postures a power it does not possess. Thanks be to God. This image, this nightmare, in broad daylight must be changed. But I rise this morning to tell you that it can be changed. There is a marvelous page of history right from the Women's Mission Society that is a part of our heritage. In the, the darkest hour in the lives of African American people. Those dark hours after Reconstruction had been betrayed, when the Ku Klux Klan was rising and riding, when the Night Riders were lynching and burning, that period that has been called the Nader in African American history. Baptist women, black and white, joined together in a group called the Bible Bands. And these mission women, they were not like women in mission societies in so many of our churches, not Allen Temple, but you know how so many of us have mission, you know, missionaries without a mission. Our mission is to wear white dress on Communion Sunday and, you know, and... No, not the Bible band. The Bible bands got up early every morning. The first thing they did was to take care of their own homes. They, they had harsh criticism for missionaries who went out to minister to others and didn't take care of their own homes. But they packed their bag. The first thing to go into the bag was the Bible. They intended to bring the light of the gospel to some home that day. The next thing to go into the bag was the primer. For they intended to bring the light of literacy to some home that day. And then... Uh, they would put a little detergent in the... It was probably that old homemade lye soap. But these missionaries with a mission were not so high and holy that they were no earthly good. When they got to a house, if the house was not clean or healthy, uh, there were a lot of children and the mother was overwhelmed, they would get down on their own knees and scrub that floor and clean that house and teach that mother how to make nutritious meals out of little or nothing and take care of a family. And they put a little medicine in the bag, the kind that grandma knew about, you know. I remember when my son, who was allergic to bee sting, and uh, one time he had bee, bee stung him and his head roll up twice the size and why we went to the doctor and it took two weeks for it to finally come down I, on the medication the doctor gave us and the doctor said he's allergic and bee sting could be fatal and you know the next time we were we were visiting in Virginia my mother's home and uh, 
Du Bois was sung, and you know, I, you know, I was out of my mind. Oh my God, the doctor says bee sting can be fatal. My Aunt Hallie Mae didn't ask a question, didn't speak a word. She took a walk around the house to some bushes. She came back with some leaves. She rubbed them on Du Bois' eye. I hadn't heard any more about that bee sting. That was 22 years ago. Thanks be to God. And now the pharmaceutical companies are going all over the world talking to indigenous peoples, trying to get the secrets so they can put them in a bottle and charge us a whole lot of money for them. And we thought it was too old fogey to even watch what mama and grandmama were doing. Oh, but the Bible bands took some healing of the mind and the healing of the spirit and some healing for the body in those bags. And they went out and they beat the bushes. And I like to say these women did hand-to-hand -hand combat against sin, sickness, death, and disease. And they didn't do it with a long-handled spoon, but they did it up close and personal. They did it house to house, shack to shack, heart to heart, hand to hand, and life to life. And you know, because of their ministry, and many women like them in the church, we came out of slavery with a literacy rate of 5% because it had been illegal to teach any black person to read or to write. But thanks be to God, because of Christian women, we, in 35 years, by 1910, they had turned 45 years. They had turned that statistic around and we moved from 5% literate to 70% literate. Don't tell me it can't be done. Don't tell me the shackles can't be removed. Don't tell me our children have to be functional illiterates. Don't tell me that they are condemned to dragging irons and, and chains and cuffs and being captured youth. So my sisters and my brothers, as you view this midnight, this nightmare in broad daylight, don't despair. Just remember who you are. Just remember whose you are. Just remember the battle has already been fought. The victory has already been won. Your job is chain removal. So take on every enemy. Take on death, sickness, and disease. Do battle. Make it hand to hand, heart to heart, shack to shack, tenement to tenement, and life to life. A child is being violently killed in this country every three, every three hours in the United States of America. Do not despair. Stand with children. Stand for children. There is a demonic, damnable piece of legislation making its way to the Senate floor right now called Senate Bill 10. It's not about reducing crime. It's not about preventing crime. It's a politician's excuse to be able to appear to be tough on crime at a time when despite horrendous incidents like this past week, crime is on the decline. But rather than a bill to prevent crime by working with children, by keeping children out of jail, this law just opens up the floodgates and will pour more and more and more 
of our children into the jails. It will house them with adults so that they will be raped and abused as they were 25 years ago when we changed the law the first time. And then they'll be tutored into becoming full-time professional competent criminals. This law must be stopped. It will uh, uh, um, turn truants and confused children, nonviolent offenders into convicts. It will um, and, 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 and open up the records of children so that a child who's confused and does something wrong at age 13 or 14 comes to age 18 and has straightened up and wants to go to college, the record is open and all the college uh, admissions office can say, we see you were arrested uh, at age 13, we don't want you. Uh, they go to get a job and the employer can open up the records and say, well, we see what you did when you were 13, we don't want you. Wherever they go and you know what the result of that is. My sisters and my brothers, our struggle is practical. It's high and holy, but it's right down here on earthly ground. So let's fight the good fight of faith. Let's do what we have to do and know while we're fighting the battle that there is now no unconquered space. Jesus Christ has been there. He's broken the shackles. He set the captives free. Our job is to remove the chains. Remove the chains. Remove the chains. So let's do our work. And while we're working, let's sing our victory song. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.